Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of Hamza in the House, the American Muslim podcast, where we give a voice to the American Muslim and Muslims throughout the West. Uh, today we have a really good topic, uh, unlocking your full potential and breaking those bad habits. So in the studio today in the house, I've got, uh, again, a repeat guest, uh, Sheikh Hatim, who came all the way from Muscat so that we could sit and have this conversation. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Hamza, I'm fine, alhamdulillah. And thank you again for inviting me uh, on your podcast. I'm really honored and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the strength uh, to give out the, the, the right word and uh, to guide our our brothers and sisters to the right path and guide ourselves also to the right path. Ameen, ameen. So yeah, this is an interesting topic. Um, a lot kind of goes under the umbrella of, of your potential. And I mean, we could look at our potential in a, in a number of ways, like our potential for success, our potential for accomplishments, our potential as Muslims. I mean, there's so many different avenues to approach um, how, how we unlock our potential. But I think really what we're trying to focus on is is productivity and making the best of our uh, our time here on earth, which is very, very limited and um, kind of breaking bad habits that we may be involved in and kind of giving advice and discussing the, the different concepts and ideas that they go along with this. Yes, I think, uh, Brother Hamza, we as uh, Muslims uh, should be uh, leading the pack when it comes to productivity because we have a purpose behind this. Uh, every single thing that we do we are accountable and we are asked for on the day of judgment so um, our lives does not revolve only uh, uh, in this world but they they are extended to the next world to the hereafter so this should be like an alarming factor for us to work hard to strive to seek every single moment to do uh, goodness uh, because we are looking at the life after this life which is the the reality and not the uh, the illusion that we're living at the moment because this is a temporary world and uh, sooner or later we're going to go back to reality once we depart but productivity can be in different forms and ways um, every per every single person would look at it from a different angle someone who plays sports you know uh, 40 hours a week he feels that he is productive. Someone who reads books every single day for three hours, four hours, uh, he's reading novels, he feels that he is productive. And someone who is like praying uh, all the time and reciting the Quran, he feels that he's productive. So it's very important in the beginning just to, to identify what is productivity, you know, what is considered to be productive and what is just being busy. And if you notice in today's world, uh, Brother Hamza, you call up your friends or colleagues and everyone is claiming to be busy. But if you really ask them, what are you doing? You know, wh why are you so busy? They don't have a solid answer. You know, they they would say that, OK, I'm busy at home, I'm busy at work, but busy doing what? You know, so uh, to define productivity, um, as a Muslim, not in the general sense. Productivity is doing something lawful. Productivity is doing something for the sake of Allah. Productivity is doing something useful for you and useful for others. So these are the three main elements that confine the term productivity. Yeah. So if you are within these three uh, conditions then uh, you would consider yourself to be a productive person and again i'm going back to the muslim perspective yeah, yeah. because uh, people of other faiths would be looking at it in a total different uh, way where they would associate it with monetary gain with publicity with fame with achieving goals and so on yeah um, so how can a Muslim be productive? And if we want to know how a Muslim 
uh, can be productive, we should go to the basics and see what the Prophet, peace be upon him, says about this. And there are two important uh, uh, prophetic tradition that talks about this uh, Hamza. I would state the first one, which says the foot of a human being would not be uh, moved on the day of judgment until they are asked about four things about their life in what they dedicated it in about their body what they did with it and about their knowledge what they did with it and about their wealth where did they get it from and where did they spend it in so let us break down this uh, this formula hamza first of all um I don't know if you came across this hadith uh, and what do you think of it before I comment on it? Yeah, it, it's it's a pretty common hadith. It, it's pretty well known. Um, and it basically covers all realms. Like like if you think of, see, for, for me, productivity is the um, efficient use, efficient and effective use of time and resources. So what are those resources that we have? We have health. We have wealth, we have time, we, we have, you know, the knowledge. So those are the resources. Are we using those resources effectively and to the, the, the most potential, I guess, is, since we're going to come full circle to this, uh, or are we using it to the highest potential possible? Or are we wasting away um, those resources? Are we, are we throwing them away either by not, not using them or by not using them appropriately. Yes. So if we break it down, uh, Hamza, step by step, um, we start with the, with the first one. Your life, what you dedicated your life in. You know, people live for fame. People live to make money. People live to harm other people. People live, you know, uh, um, to, uh, to make a difference in this world. So... To start off, ask yourself as a person, as an individual, what have you dedicated your life for? Yeah, and this would be very simple and very easy and straightforward for you to answer because you can't fool yourself. Nobody knows you better than you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows you more than yourself. So the next is this temporary uh, vehicle or the body that was provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take us from point A to point B. What did you utilize it? Uh, what did you utilize it in? Remember when we spoke about uh, um, uh, social media in the last episode, we spoke about the people who are uh, taking photos of their bodies, they are muscular and, you know, they're showing off. Okay, so he, this is one aspect of it. Okay, so you have this this strength, this health in, in the body that Allah gave it to you. What did you utilize this in? You know, uh, did you help out, uh, you know, people who are in need for the strength? Did you save and protect person who is being oppressed by the strength? What did you do? Or did you just take off your shirt on the beach? So this is the, the area where you need to, to really think, you know, so you know, remember in the beginning when I said you can be working out in the gym 40 hours a day, that doesn't mean you're productive. Right. Okay, you're taking care of your body, but you're not productive. Um, and then the next one says your knowledge. What did you do with that knowledge that you have? And a lot of people today associate knowledge with, you know, like scholars. I have to be a scholar. I have to memorize a thousand book to be knowledgeable. Sometimes the very little knowledge that you know makes a huge difference to someone else. I give an example, Hamza. Us being uh, yeah, and the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, being believers, being Muslims, okay? We have Surah Al-Ikhlas, okay, that describes who our Creator is, who Allah is. Uh, the chapter Qul Hu Allahu Ahad, Allahu Samad. Now, for a person living in the Amazon, Okay, who is uh, doesn't follow any faith, any religion, any ideology, doesn't recognize a supreme power as God, you know, 
to you this small chapter might be insignificant you say this is not knowledge but to someone else this knowledge means life and death means salvation from hellfire so don't underestimate what you know just because it's just small information or it's a general information that everybody knows so the, and, and, and then the other aspect is that you have a lot of knowledgeable people Hamza uh, like scholars but when you ask them to share that knowledge they say no 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 I'm still a student of knowledge I'm not uh, you know I'm not there yet when will you be there you know when will you share this knowledge when will you teach others and this is not uh, this is applicable for everything that we do whether you're an engineer doctor philosopher mathematician anything you have knowledge do something with that knowledge but don't harm others with that knowledge you know don't be a, a scientist who is very knowledgeable but who is making bombs to kill innocent people don't be knowledgeable in biology and create viruses to harm other people and so on that's the knowledge part and then um, the last part is that the wealth you know which is the most important thing that we live for for the majority of the people in this world where did you get it from and where did you spend it and this is a very tricky area because everybody wants money everybody wants wealth possessions okay and there's nothing wrong with that we don't say that as a Muslim you should live in a cave you should be you know the poorest man on earth you should hate money no that's not what what we're saying you know we don't say that being rich being wealthy being you know influential is a bad thing no because if you're not rich if you don't have access money how will you pay zakah yeah so there's nothing wrong with having wealth but where did you get it from and what are you spending that money in yeah that's um actually in the the book review we just did um about 44 ways to manhood one of the the topics in there was halal provisions mm. like how you're supporting your family and and providing halal provisions for them so i mean all actually everything we just said was covered in the book about manhood and uh it starts with halal provisions yeah not not only where you earn your money but it's like okay how do you distribute that money so um sometimes we we throw away small sums of money because we see it as insignificant right i go and i buy this very expensive cup of coffee that i don't need which isn't even good for me and we say well it's only you know a couple of reals no problem yeah but it's like okay but what would those reals have done if you put them somewhere else to work for you and the thing is um the one thing we can take away from um the banking system when we we look at people who are like financial advisors and you know they're really into money and how to make money one of the things that they're always trying to impress on people is like make getting your money to work for you they're like how do you get your money to work for you mm -hmm. and muslims would be thinking the same way how do, how do i get my money to work for me right if i if i spend this money on this expensive food that i don't really need I, i'm not earning my full potential right i could i could choose a, a less expensive meal and increase the amount of money that i give in charity and then that the money i give in charity now is working for me yes right so so the way that we it, it is an investment it's it's just like the financial sector we're investing only we're expecting our returns much much later we're, we're in a long-term um plan right so our financial gains uh we're not looking at a portfolio in which i'm looking for returns monthly or quarterly my returns i know that i'm not going to see them on paper but I still invest. I still continue to put money into that investment because I know that it's a long-term investment, but it, the, the returns on that, the percentage of returns on that 
supersedes any kind of uh, investment you can do here on earth in, in your lifetime. So looking at where your money is coming from, how you're going to distribute that money, um, and, and how you're really using your money. I think a lot of people spend money without actually thinking about if it's being spent in the right way. They just, it's just, it's my money and I just spend it on the things that I want. That That's the first mistake that we do, uh, Sad Hamza, saying that it is our money. It's never our money yeah. because it is a provision that was given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not out of our own smartness, not out of our own effort, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed for us to get it. And when we depart this world, all this wealth will remain here. We're not taking it with us. I once had a debate with someone, one of, one of the brothers. We were discussing about a, a very wealthy uh, Muslim businessman. This guy, uh, he lives uh, um, in Africa and he is really wealthy. So he has a private jet. Whenever he feels like during the week to go and pray in uh, Mecca, he just, you know, flies to Mecca, prays like Juma, and then comes back for lunch in his house in Africa. And I thought that this is ironic because the amount of money that you spent for the fuel, for the jet and, and the effort, you know, uh, you, can, you could have fed an entire tribe. Yeah. Uh, in, in Africa and my friend was arguing with me and he said but this guy does a lot of charity work and I said as long as there are still hungry people in Africa and and the rest of the world I I don't think it's justifiable because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not hold him accountable that he did not go and pray Juma in Mecca but he will hold him accountable knowing that they are his neighbors who are hungry and he could have helped them but he chose to go and pray in Mecca and I, I, I might be wrong but he would get tons of reward more feeding empty bellies than praying in Mecca. No, I, I completely agree. They, there's people too who in the US they'll make Hajj every year and they've made Hajj every year for like 20 years and my bro, you got your Hajj, man. You got it. Why don't you pay for someone else to go, yeah. right? And even so, Hajj is not mandatory if you can't afford it. So better yet, why don't you take that money, that ten thousand dollars that you're going to spend on a trip, and yeah, and invest it in the people who, in your own community who are suffering. But a lot of people don't think that way. I, I don't. I don't understand what's so difficult about this concept, where even. Um, you'll see uh, the decoration of Masajid, right? You, you got to have this big dome and you got to have these gold fixtures. You, you just you... Uh, touched on the wound, uh, uh, Hamza. Um, how, many, how many people come to, to pray at the Masjid, uh, Hamza? You know, you have thousands of mosques and you hardly get two lines. Yeah. And then you suddenly see they are expanding the mosque because on Friday, on Jum'ah, ah, people are praying outside. You are expanding the mosque and utilizing these resources, okay, just for one day a week for an hour. Okay, you could have had a sh shade. While the, the neighboring uh, houses around the mosque are starving, people who, are, who haven't had anything to eat. Uh, they, there must be something wrong in the way we think. We can't have this expensive dome, this golden dome, and this expensive Italian marble while the neighbors of the mosque are starving. Yeah, it, it seems like those kind of decorations, those are the things that come when you don't know what else to do with your money. Like, I, 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 I've, I've given money to everybody. Everybody's got food. Everybody has a place to stay. Everybody, it's like this complete excess wealth. Like, yeah. There's nowhere else to spend this money. Okay, let's beautify the masajid. Okay, like, but it's not, but people put it way, way higher on the list. And it's unfortunate, but, you know, maybe their intentions are in the right place. Um, but I, I still, it's, I see it as a complete waste of money because 
I'm, I, I don't care what the inside of it looks like, to be honest. I don't even care if it has carpet. I just want a place to pray. Yeah, I mean, and, and we want to really take it there. The Sahaba didn't have these lavish carpets with air conditioning and, you know, all the sound systems. And again, we don't want people to to, you know, to understand us uh, in the wrong way. We don't say to go and pray, you know, on dirt and, uh, you know, without air con and this. No, have it to the minimum, yeah. you know, have it where it's enough for you to do the the, the minimum. You know, you don't have to have the gold dome and, and the, the Italian marble. You don't have to have lavish, uh, a lavish uh, chandelier, you know, things that can don't really add value. Yeah. And it becomes like, oh, our neighboring village has a better mosque than ours. Let us build double the size of the, uh, that mosque. Yeah, that happens quite a bit, um, especially when people start describing Masajid by the Kabila who, that built it. Yeah, that's that's masjid is from this family. That's that's a whole different chapter. Let's go back to productivity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so using your wealth to your full potential, look at investments in things that are are much more long term. So, education um, is a long term thing that is beneficial that you can continue to get good rewards for. Um, giving in charity. Like especially when it comes to building schools, building orphanages, building masajid, long-term investments, right? So you, you put money in and you're earning the rewards over and over and over again. So looking at the amount of money that you're spending and, and what you're getting in return, if we were to really break it down into the money I earn and the money I actually need to survive, I think you would realize that a very, very small portion of your salary is actually necessary, which then would make the rest of it excess. Yes. Right. Which then should be invested in, in something or other. So, yeah, making sure that that money is halal, make sure that you're using it to its full potential. So stop investing in short term gratification. Yeah, I can go buy that, you know, six real chocolate cake that I'm going to put on Instagram so that everybody can <laughs> see. But once I eat that cake, it goes through my digestive system and it's like, like everything else. It, it, it's finished. Yeah. Like you've wasted six reals on something that you didn't really need. And you could have put it in something that had a, a much bigger return. One of the um, aspects that we um, embedded in our lives today, uh, Brother Hamza, is the term I am bored. Yeah. I can't comprehend this term, uh, Hamza. How can someone be bored in this world while there's a lot to be done? You know, and the people who are very, very productive wish and pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would create 27 hours a day, not mm. 24, because they don't have time. There's so many other things that they can do but a lot of the young people today and even the older people you'd find them sitting at home doing nothing yeah and then they start complaining saying that i'm bored i realize uh, that we're facing a problem uh, brother hamza you know being a muslim you can't be bored because being a muslim is built on social responsibility yeah, and the Prophet ﷺ practiced this and the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they practiced social responsibility when they were with the Prophet ﷺ. So you would see examples like Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, or Sayyidina Umar ibn al-Khattab, who are the caliphs, who are the leaders of the Muslims. And at night, instead of being at home, having a rest, they are carrying sacks of rice yeah. and, 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 and uh, food stuff to the poor. This is social responsibility. You would find someone like uh, Sayyida Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Wasallam, you know, teaching the companions about fiqh and aqidah, about their religion. Yeah. So they always did something productive for their society. You know, the, the term I am bored <laughs> came because we revolved our lives on what we want and what we like. If I don't get anything that attracts me as a person, Hatim, oh, I, I love music, but I don't have 
there's nothing interesting to listen to today, then I'm bored. Yeah. But if I revive my life over the lives of other people, okay, let us let, let me go and see my neighborhood. Maybe the masjid needs cleaning. Maybe my neighbor doesn't have, you know, he has an, a broken window he wants someone to help with. Maybe there's someone who is sick needs to be dropped to the hospital. There's always something to do. You can never claim that I'm bored. Yeah, it's like the people who have satellite TV and there's like 4,000 channels and they're flipping through and they're like, ah, oh, there's nothing to watch. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Like, yeah. That's, that's the best example. Yeah. That's the best example. It's like, no, it's just, not, there's plenty to watch. It's just nothing that you particularly want to watch it at this time. You know, when I was a kid, if, if my mother heard me say, I, I'm bored. There's nothing to do. She's like, oh, you want you want something to do? I'll, I'll give you something I'll, to I'll do. Give you something. Go get that mop and that bucket <laughs> over there. <laughs> you know, so there's always something to do. Yeah. And, and taking taking responsibility for that time requires discipline. Um, that's one of the things that is is missing. There's so much of this missing in, in society today is is self-discipline. We don't want to discipline ourselves. We want to just have it our way all the time. You know, sometimes you might have to force yourself to do something. You you might have to push yourself. One of the th one of the problems with the discipline, uh, brother Hamza, is that people don't respect time now. Yeah. So when people say that uh, they they would come uh, today, they'd come. They, if they promise you to come today, they'll come tomorrow. If they promised you to submit an assignment. Today, they would submit it after three days. And we have become very, very creative in coming up with excuses. Yeah. You yeah. know, if you, when you hear the episode we did on the, the manhood, yeah. me and Ejaz had a whole blowout about time and being on time because it's one of my pet peeves. I cannot stand when people don't come on time and don't respect my time. But yeah, it's because we take time for granted, right? We, we there's just, We've always had time, so we think we're always going to have time. So discipline molds you into a system where you are programmed that you have certain tasks you have to finish and you have to fulfill. And your mind will tell you that you have slots doing nothing and you can also fill them with something else. That's why um, uh, we are asked as Muslim to always remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And did ever anyone ever wonder, why do we need to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the whole day? Because we will have those times where we don't have anything to do. Then fill it up with remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead of being bored. Yeah. Because that will g grant you the investment you, you spoke about, uh, Brother Hamza, and also it will give it will keep you it will keep you into that circle of being uh, being productive and being thankful and being grateful and thinking of others you know one of the things that the prophet sallallahu used to always ask for in dua is, is protection from laziness yes and that's what we're affected with. I think it's it's human nature for the majority of us. I mean, you have a few individuals who don't suffer this, but we get lazy and we just don't want to do anything. It's not like we don't have the energy. It's not like we don't have the time. We just don't want to do anything. So if you can discipline yourself, if you can really push yourself through those times, a lot of times once you get started doing something, then those feelings begin to go away. So like going to the gym, there will be days where I'm like, I, I don't feel like going to the gym at all. Like, I would rather just sit here and do nothing. But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to spend at least 10 minutes in the gym. After, after 10 minutes, I don't feel like it anymore, then I'll come home. But what usually happens the majority of the time, once you start working, once you start getting the blood flowing. You get excited. Then you're like, all right, yeah, I'm good. And then you end up staying there for 45 minutes to an hour getting a good workout. But it just takes that that push in the right direction. It takes pushing yourself and getting yourself. Uh, it, it's like uh, getting the ball rolling. Once you get it rolling, it's it's easy from there. You would uh, be surprised, uh, Sal Hamza, some of the times where you have uh, very silly excuses. I'm a student at the moment, uh, uh, 
um, getting my bachelor's in uh, in media and i have my colleagues in class they are 19 18 years old you know and i'm uh, 43 so when the the lecturer gives us an assignment a, a huge assignment the the always this excuse pops up you know sir we have uh, five papers in the semester and we don't have time you know give us more time and I always respond to them and I say I have a full-time job eight hours a day I'm a full-time husband I'm a full-time dad I, I work in the radio station I work in the TV station and, and I'm, a, I'm a part-time student and I have the time to do the assignment but you guys you only have to study and you don't have time to do the assignment what an what an, an excuse yeah we used to have there was a saying uh when i was in the marines we time is very important of course in the military and um if anyone ever came in the next day and was like i didn't have time they'd be like did you did you sleep last night I'm like yeah then you had time you had time yeah. you had time you just chose to to use that time for something else so there's never an excuse of i don't have time you always have time Right? Did you did, did you uh, spend eight hours sleeping last night? Well, you maybe you should have slept six and spent two hours taking care of this thing. So it's not an excuse. I mean, there there are people who literally have no time left because all of their time has been budgeted. Like uh, remember Mufti Mink when yes. he came to visit us. Literally, if you look at his itinerary, we're talking about minutes. Like okay, you got four minutes to do this yeah. and then you're off to the next. like there was literally no such thing as doubt time yeah. not like hey i've got i've got 20 minutes over here to f like no that every single minute is accounted for and and the the amount of productivity that that brother does in a day is astonishing uh when i sat with uh, most of the uh, the scholars okay who visit uh, aman they say that they spend almost a month and a half per year with their families yeah the rest of the time they're flying from they're bounce they're not flying mm -hmm. they're bouncing from one country to, to the other and this is their life yeah and when we spoke about discipline it is attached to priorities yeah yeah what are your priorities in life so if you don't have priorities you will not have discipline but if you have priorities, you know what comes first. If you have a task to do, you would tell your friends, I'm sorry, I can't go to the coffee shop with you today because this task is more important than the three real coffee that I'm going to spend, you know, all the time, the half an hour I'm going to spend uh, cracking jokes with you guys. So having priorities of what your purpose you remember we spoke about your aim what is your purpose yeah. in this life uh, when you have a purpose you have a priority list when you have a priority list then you have a discipline system when you have a discipline system and then you have accountability am i accountable now for my actions or not but if you have all these things not in place you don't know what is important in your life then you'll just live like like anybody else yeah it's like an entire work ethic involved when you look at some of the most successful people in the world in, in terms of i mean secular ideas of what success is look at their work ethic ceos people who are running successful businesses i mean they're working like 18 hour days and you know they're traveling they're on the road and stuff because for them the end game is their success in that particular field in that business yes. so they're dedicating their time they're putting their time in in order to make that successful we can apply that same ideology to our lives but in the frame of reference of of, of what we're investing in in our islam in our afterlife how how much time am i devoting to make this concept work right some people maybe spend an hour a day even thinking about Islam, right? Some people, n none, none. They don't, th they wake up and they go to sleep in the same day and not one single thought of Islam enters their brain, not even to make the prayer. 
So how much time are you devoted, right? If you put zero amount of time into uh, thinking about Islam, into being productive in Islam, in 10 years, where's your Islam going to be? It's going to be at the same level it was at. Yeah. So if you want any kind of growth, if you want any type of um, advancement, you're going to have to put the work in, right? When you look at people who are uh, knowledgeable, how many hours have they put into research and, and studying and memorizing? I mean, it's a very long and tedious process. Did you come, ever come across the pe people or individuals uh, who look at, look at someone who is very successful and they say, oh, he got, he's lucky, you know? Yeah. There's nothing called luck, luck. in life. These people, they worked so hard day and night, they dedicated themselves, they uh, brushed their skills and reached where they are today. But unfortunately, people think that, oh, I'll just sleep and get up in the morning and everything will work out. If they see uh, Brother Hamza today having uh, this podcast, they, they would assume that, oh, he came from the States and he knew how to do it. Yeah, but they did, they don't know the number of hours yeah. that he he uh, surfed the YouTube trying to find out how this works. He went to the market and found equipment and put everything together and then learned how to edit. And here we are today listening to his podcast. Uh, everything has to be through dedication and through a plan. And unfortunately, um, Brother Hamza, we have lost that competitive nature of us as Muslims. Yeah. You know, it's okay for us to be number five. It's okay for us to be number ten. What happened to be number one? Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran Wafi Dalika Falyatanafas al Mutanafisun. And in that should those who compete compete. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering is is ordering us to compete yeah. in everything, especially in goodness. But we are, you know, content with number 10 and number 11. And I would, I would share this uh, last point before I, I, I let you say something. You find regular Muslims, you know, and you hear these very silly conversations that they have. And they say, you know, the most important thing is just for me to touch the door of Jannah, of Paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you Al-Firdaus, the highest level of heaven. And you only want to touch the door. You only want the, the minimum. Well, if I ask you today, Brother Hamza, what plot would you want to build your house? You would choose the best plot in the neighborhood. But when it comes to your everlasting plot, you only want the door, you only want the minimum, the lowest level. This is how competitive we have become. Yeah, there, that reminds me, there was a, a sister who asked the sheikh one time, she said, um, you know, I'm not really practicing Islam, you know, I don't pray and stuff. And, you know, I know that I'll go to the hellfire, but I'm not going to be there forever, right? And it's like, wait, say that again? So she acknowledges, I, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I know that I'll probably go into the hellfire, but but it's not forever, right? I'll, I'll eventually come out of the hellfire. But like, is that the standard you're really setting for yourself? <laughs> Can you bear even one moment? Yeah, I'm, d just dip your finger into it. Like, are you crazy? But this is some of the attitudes of people. Like, yeah, they just, the bare minimum. And like, what, what if we don't go out? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where's your guarantee that you'll get out? And uh, subhanAllah, now with the, the technology, these gadgets that we have, um, you, you find us being, um, you know, uh, occupied throughout the day with social media and, and so on. And at the end of the day, we claim to be busy. Yeah. We claim to be, you know, uh, not knowing what to do. While there's a lot, even on social media, even on social media, someone like Mufti Mink, you just mentioned earlier, you know, he has videos constantly, new videos coming up. He's on social media, but he's doing something productive which serves his purpose in this life. 
But what about me and you, my dear brothers and sisters? You know, what did we do? How productive are we? And don't we feel ashamed sometimes, you know, that other, people's are, other people are doing things in life, you know, in all fields, and we are doing nothing? You know, Brother Hamza, what got me uh, into the Dawa area in the first place? I started off uh, following YouTube videos and I saw all these scholars and sheikhs uh, from the West, you know, uh, speaking about Islam. And I felt so bad uh, and I felt really ashamed that Islam started here in the Middle East and we are the worst people to propagate this, uh, this message, you know. And I, and I said to myself, you know, I have to dedicate myself to at least be, you know, somewhere close to, to, to these guys because they're doing an amazing job. And that's where I started, you know, working hard and hard and hard, trying to, to make a difference. And I want everyone else to do the same, uh, Brother Hamza, you know, find a passion, find a purpose to do something. Yeah. One of the, a good indicator on, on whether or not you're spending your time productively or not is is how you perceive that time as it passes. So generally, if you feel like time is moving extremely slow, like it's taking forever, dragging on, it's because what you're doing is not worth it, right? That's why people get bored. They're like, oh, I'm so bored. It's taking forever. But what are you, you're just sitting there looking at the clock. When you do something that's really productive, yes. you look at the clock and you're just like, man, oh, it's that time already? I had this other thing to do, but I want to finish this thing. Then you start seeing conflicts in time. Like then you feel like there's not enough time because what you're doing is more productive. It fills that time more efficiently because there's like, there's a baraka in time when it's used wisely. So I think that that's one of the signs. I mean, of course, this is not like a blanket statement for everything, but generally speaking, when you, when you're doing something, you feel bored. It's because it's, it's not a productive thing. You need to find something that's more productive. There is a verse in the Holy Quran where the disbelievers, when they are in the hellfire, they would request one thing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would say, Rabbi arji'oon, O oh my Lord, send us back mm -hmm. so that we could do goodness. That is the statement that they say. They want to go back to this world so that they can do goodness, you know. And unfortunately, we can't go back. Yeah. Once you depart from this world, game over. And the, the worst part is nobody knows when they would depart. So this brings me to the concept of procrastination. You know, people who have good intentions and say, you know what, tomorrow I'll be productive. Tomorrow I will do this. Tomorrow I will do dawah. Tomorrow I will help my neighbor. You know, what if tomorrow do doesn't come? What if you die today? You know, what what are you going to do? Are you going to say to Almighty Allah, send me back? Yeah. <laughs> There's no sending you back. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's like time, time is not a renewable resource. When we look at all the other things, money, no problem. You lose all the money you have today, you can earn more money later. Uh, if you get, uh, if you're, you're not physically healthy, you can take medications, you can do treatments, you can change your uh, eating habits and lifestyle. You can get your health back. But time is, is, is definite. Like there is, there is a uh, set amount of time and you're never, ever, ever, no matter what you're going to do, you're going to get that time back. As we said, when you depart, you would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you want to come back and it's gone. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot to think about. I mean, all, all of those aspects. Um, but there are things that we can do, right? There's things that we can focus on and try to, to shift those things. So, you know, in, in regards to time, waking up early, um, people waste so much time sleeping. I mean, sleep is necessary and you should get at least eight hours sleep guaranteed. But that doesn't mean from one o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock in the morning. That yeah. means you go, That's go eight hours. <laughs> yeah, you got your eight hours. Yeah. Go to sleep earlier in the night, wake up for Fajr. I mean, you know what? Fajr is like, 
You know, some people talk about exercising in the morning, like really just how it changes the whole trajectory of your day. Well, Fajr is the same way. When you get up in the morning and you go and you pray Fajr in the masjid, the rest of your day is really, it's all set up from there, right? You're energized, you're awake, you're ready to go. And the amount of time you have before people even roll out of bed is substantial. There's so much that can be done. So paying attention to the time, um, maybe even creating a schedule, right? Like I, I, I typically schedule my day. Like what do I need to get accomplished? I make a list. These are the things I need to get done, right? And if at the end of the day you are able to accomplish those things, there's a, there's a sense of achievement and it actually helps you in progression because the next day then you look forward to the same thing again. And today, world uh, leaders, uh, uh, Brother Hamza, like CEOs and this, they all have the same practice, uh, the five o'clock club, where they start their day before, you know, uh, before dawn. And uh, they have the, their rituals of reading books or exercising or doing the important part of their work very early when everybody else is asleep. Even athletes, that's the time when they practice the most when they, the air is fresh and it's quiet and they have the focus. And we as Muslims, we have the blessings of Al-Fajr and we don't take advantage uh, of, this, of this blessing. Um, if you look at uh, our prayer schedule, uh, Brother Hamza, mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed it in such a way so that we can be punctual, we can be uh, productive and we can be you know uh, we can fill up the slots with the important things in in life and normally you find the people who are really careful about their prayer times they will always be also punctual in everything else they will also have priorities in everything else and they will have a very structured life but if you pray the time you wish you know and you don't really cherish these moments that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, set for you, then everything else will be chaos uh, in your life. Um, there are very small tasks uh, that we do, uh, Brother Hamza, that means a lot. They, when they are small but continuous, good deeds, yeah, they're better than doing one big task once in a lifetime. So we get into the habits, which is something very important to talk about. Habits, you know, habits, uh, good habits or bad habits. How do we get rid of them? Um, before I speak in depth about habits, I remembered something that I went for a leadership uh, training for one year. And believe me, Brother Hamza, in that one year, we learned so many skills of leadership but i only remember one because this one thing that i learned from this uh, leadership training changed my life completely we were taught how to say no and i practice it until today previously anyone who requests anything from me I say yes. Yeah. I feel bad, yeah. you know, to to let them down. But after learning this skill, my life has become very organized because I can say no. The first time someone will be offended, the next time he will respect me. Because previously I used to accept doing things for people and then I I get overwhelmed. I become unorganized. And I cannot deliver but if you say no from the beginning then it means you are respecting that person I would love to, to, to help you or do a favor to, uh, for you or do this task but I'm sorry unfortunately I don't have the enough time to do that and that's how we're supposed to be as Muslims yeah yeah, I, I don't have a problem telling people no. I, I do it all the time. Oh, where you come from the West, yeah. it's easy for you. <laughs> <laughs> but from the Middle East, it's uh, yeah. it, it, it's it's quite challenging. People are not really ready uh, for, for this change, you know. So it's not a common thing. 
Yeah, because there's just some things that are not possible. And I'll just tell you they're not possible, and I don't feel bad about it at all. But, you know. You know what the funny part is, uh, Mr. Hamza, is when I learned how to say no, it was easier to tell people no, but it was difficult to tell myself no. Yeah. Because a human being is made out of feelings and desires. And sometimes you see that that mountain of rice and meat and it's difficult to say no. So training yourself to say no to others and also training yourself to say no to yourself and tell yourself that I'm in I'm in charge. I'm the boss. Yeah. You know, when I say you're not going to eat, you're not going to eat. Yeah. So taking control of your life while you still can. Yeah, diet is a huge one because, I mean, it's hard. It really is hard. And it takes, I don't know, like a defining moment in your life, a moment of clarity where something just clicks for you. Because I like last Ramadan is when I changed my eating habits um, because, you know, I was tired all the time. So I would go to work and I would come home and I would take like an hour nap. And then I would stay up and then and it was like, I always felt tired. And I'm like, I used to not be like this. So examining the way that I eat and what I'm eating, it's like, okay, look, I'm satisfied on a small scale throughout the day by eating the things that I enjoy. But in the long run, in the hours and hours of the 24 hours a day that I feel like crap is because of the you know 40 minutes a day that i spend eating so if i can change that f those 40 minutes it will result in a change in a, the, the whole 24 hours so cutting out the the carbs you know i haven't eaten rice i can't even tell you how long and when i do it's a very small portion of breads sugars so cut it all out and you know what ha you know what honestly what happens is when you cut those things out you really crave them for about three or four weeks. Hmm. After that, you those forget cravings about are gone. Yeah. They're gone. Yeah. I can walk by the soda section at the store and I don't even, I have no feelings at all whatsoever. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I don't. It's all psychological. Yeah. So it's like you have to really, yeah, your body is a liar. Your body is going to lie to you all the time about everything. And, and come up with all sorts of excuses. Excuses, yeah. Oh, you, this is the last. You exercise is good. This, you deserve this, this. This is the last time you have this donut. <laughs> come on. It's the last time. Yeah. Oh, 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 the cheat day. Cheat day, yeah. Which, which is six days a week. Now, I, I started with the cheat day, then I just stopped doing cheat days because the problem with cheat days is people um, abuse that cheat day. Like, because, you know, and the caloric intake over the week. Especially when, when you're in the Middle East, you eat a, ho a whole camel. Oh, man. On a cheat day. <laughs> you know, and 10 kilos of rice <laughs> piled up. So um, when you get your diet, correct it's really amazing the effect it has on the rest of your your life like your health improves your your um your mood changes um your you think clearer you don't get that fatigue you don't feel tired you know when i was eating a carb heavy diet like with rice and stuff as soon as i finish eating i feel extremely tired like i could lay down and take a nap now i eat and i feel energetic like I could go out and do exercise. I can actually use the food that I ate. So changing your diet is is a huge step in the right direction, um, and it teaches yourself self discipline. So if I can if I can get that under control, then I can get other aspects in my life under control easier. Did you notice that the hadith I mentioned mm -hmm. uh, revolves on productivity? All the elements are, you know, complement one another. Yeah, because you for you to be productive. You need your youth, you need your health, you need money, you need uh, time, mm -hmm. and you need to be alive. You don't want to be dead for you to be productive. Yeah. So you can be very productive, but if you have eating disorder, you have issues, you have obesity, sooner or later, you are not going to continue to be productive. Yeah, having those things proportionately, like uh, you'll find there are doctors make loads of money, but they can never spend it because they're spending 70 hours a week in the hospital yes. earning that money. So it's like, okay, you got the money part, 
but now you don't have any time. And then you have people who are sitting at home. They've got all the time in the world, but they don't have any money. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So it's like you had to have all of those things in, in proportionate to the other. So it would be, would be helpful. Okay, so here are, here are three tips. Um, the first one is avoid the comfort zone. And by comfort zone, I mean, you know, sometimes in life we just get caught up in the day-to-day -day things. As long as I'm not needing something, I feel very comfortable. Work is going good. The family's good. The house is good. Everything's good. So you just kind of stay static. You're not looking to progress. You're not looking to uh, enter into any other avenues. You're just kind of stuck in place. I want to comment on that uh, is the, the part where we spoke about, you know, I'm bored. Yeah. I would say that I am a person who really gets bored easily if I am doing something constantly over and over again. This is my sixth job that I change <laughs> in the past 26 years. Uh, and I, I do this because I am looking for new challenges. I am looking for new w ways to do things. Because as you said, if you are in the comfort zone, you have this f thick salary, you have the routine job, you know, you're in your comfort zone, you have the job security, then you don't ha you don't have that passion, you don't have that spark. But if you're in, 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 in a challenge in something that you can try and learn and a skill and improve, then I give an example, I started, uh, uh, I started giving lectures in only English. And then after a few years, I said, this is becoming, you know, too normal no challenge. I started doing it in Arabic and English. And then after a few years, I said, you know what, let me add a third language, which was very challenging for me. And I started doing it in Swahili now. Mm -hmm. And God knows, maybe next year I'm going to do it in Chinese. Or anything. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that don't be in the comfort zone. Always give yourself a very difficult task for you to achieve. That will give you a sense of, uh, you know, a sense of passion why are you living you know if, you, if everything is easy if you have a, a golden spo a spoon uh, fed to you every single day there's no point of living yeah you always, you have to have a goal you have to have the next level you're trying to get to even wealthy people are like this and and people always ask they're like well this guy's got you know 500 million dollars why why doesn't he just retire and sit at home and live off that money uh, but because you don't understand his mind 500 million today, but next year he wants 600 million. Yes. And then he wants 700. Like he's always setting the goal higher. He reaches that goal, move to the next goal. And maybe it's not even about the money. It's about the passion of trying new exactly. things and, and, and acquiring new things. It's, it's being more and more successful. And, and that's how they equate success is because money is tangible. You can count it. Yes. So that's how I know that I my business is better because now it's worth more money. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, and in order to set those goals and to do things, you need to identify your strengths and weaknesses. Mm. You need to honestly look at yourself and say, what is it that I am good at and what is it that I'm really weak in? And then that way you know where you need to work. So your weaknesses, um, you can work on those so that they may never be strengths. You know, we, we, all of us have weaknesses. They may never necessarily turn into your strengths, but you can make them not as weak as you are now. Um, the last thing I have is being prepared for unexpected um, opportunities. Mm. So being in a position where you can help if the, the opportunity arises. So if, if someone were to come and say, um, hey, you know, the neighbors down the street, they had a house fire and now they need um, money for this, this and this. Well, if you spend all your money on nonsense, yeah. you're not going to be able to contribute anything. You missed your opportunity because you were not prepared. But if you said, you know what, mashallah, I've been saving, you know, $50 a, a month, every month for the past three years. Here you go. So what you're trying to say is we have to be proactive and not reactive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a Muslim, always be prepared for the unknown. Acquire the skill because you never know when you need it. All right. I think that that wraps it up. Yeah, I think we covered 
just about everything we needed to cover. Um, just, you know, be more productive. And a lot of it just has to do with being conscious of time. Because, we, you know, we just get involved in life and then things are going. And the next thing you know, you know, you look back and go, oh, that yeah, that was, that was a waste of time. I probably shouldn't do it. So you have to really, you have to focus on it. You have to pay attention to it. Or else it just, you know, time flies and, and, and you missed your, your opportunity. And once it's gone, it's gone. That's it. One, one of the last things that I want to mention, uh, Brother Hamza, there is a misconception out there that only the old people will depart and only the sick will depart and I still have time. Well, the good news, my friend, no one, none of us have time because none of us can guarantee what tomorrow lies for us. We have young people pass away. We have healthy people pass away. We have people who don't get up in the morning. They passed away while they were asleep. So do we have to wait until that moment comes or do we do it now? Sometimes people ask me, you know, you had a long day at work, you know, and then you had classes at night. And then you go back home and you edit videos for Dao and this. Why don't you take a break? I don't have a break. There's no time for break. The break is going to be in Al Jannah. And the reason why I'm doing this, uh, Brother Hamza, when I was a young man at the age of 18, 19, I was bitten by a snake and I was in a coma for four days. And I realized after that experience that time is so precious and if I had kicked the bucket in that incident khalas, it's gone but when I woke up I realized that you know what I'm not gonna do this again I'm not gonna do the same mistake again I'm gonna utilize every single second that I have for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us sincerity in every single thing that we do Sure. Yeah, so it's unfortunate that sometimes we need that little event in our life that reminds you yeah. of how fragile you are. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Shukran. Barakallah uh, Afiq. Great, uh, great podcast. I can't wait to have you on again so we can talk about some other things, inshallah. Thanks for coming in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.